Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad or Brad Laurie. And today I'm honored to speak about One Ledger once again. It's all about being business to the blockchain and doing it in a way that doesn't just use current and, and contemporary models, but also acknowledges the traditional models as well. Now, to understand more about how this is happening, we have two core members of the team. We have Ali, who is an important member as the director of products. So, Ali, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for having me, Brad. You're welcome, mate. We also have the CSO. His name is Bob Bins. Bob, thank you also for your time today. Delighted to be with you, Brad. Thanks for the opportunity. Very welcome. Now, One Ledger, it's an important business concept. It's doing something that's really bringing in blockchain to the conversation to really change the way enterprise does business. But I wanted to ask you, Ali, firstly, in a nutshell, how would you explain to the public this unique position that One Ledger is trying to create? So One Ledger is actually trying to go after three different uh, blockchain industry. Um, one of them is scalability. So looking at um, side chains and channels and how they can actually help scale um, blockchain um, uh, like uh, transactions per second as well as their throughput. And simultaneously, we're also looking at interoperability, which is one of the big pain points that um, that One Ledger is going after. Um, essentially, what we want to be able to do is bring multiple blockchains um to the table where you know one ledger acts like a gateway and allows you to access multiple blockchains simultaneously um we do this through uh, through hash time locks and atomic swaps and more specifically we're building an adapter that allows you to uh connect things like ethereum bitcoin sorry yeah ethereum bitcoin um as well as um any other uh blockchain that you can think fathomable so we will look we're, because we're going after the enterprise um the enterprise use cases, we will be looking at um, integrating with Hyperledger, um, obviously, you know, Ethereum for, for enterprises there, um, and a bunch of others, um, bringing them all together under one platform. Um, right. one, um, and then obviously enterprise connectivity is the other, th the third pain point that we're going after. And essentially that's allowing us to connect in enterprises, bypassing what firewalls through our SDK, um, so, that we, so that enterprises have the accessibility into watching. Okay, so Bob, obviously, why Alex explaining this is that it's all about integrating permission with permissionless systems to, and really bring that to the fore for enterprise. But what about the other aspect of this with regard to centralized and decentralized models? My understanding is that you regard them both seriously and highly and they both have validity. Yeah, so thanks for pointing that out, Brad. You know, I, I would uh, long, long in the tooth with the enterprise, their behavior. Uh, and if you look at what the stats say, you know, every, most enterprises are experimenting at this stage. We have very little evidence of, uh, of blockchain systems being integrated with current operational systems. So we're in the kind of experimental stage. And typically what the enterprise will want to do is want to set up blockchain inside. So private chains. Um, and at some point in the future, not unlike what they did when uh, they adopted internet technologies, first we had intranets, use of internet technologies, and then when protocols were available, we reached outside the enterprise to, through these protocols to reach the public internet. Now, many years later, 20, fully integrated. Well, let's apply that to blockchain. Initially, the enterprise is likely to use a centralized system, control closed, but want to take advantage of blockchain technologies. Ergo, one ledger can be your one ledger for blockchain technology experimentation, blockchain technology, blockchain technology infrastructure inside the enterprise. Mm -hmm. At some point in the future, and I might add it's you know two to three years after initial sort of use cases are in place, you want to reach out now and touch to the public blockchain. One ledger protocol to reach from the enterprise now into the public blockchain. And you can use the one ledger network in the public world as well. And so that's what the strategy that we see. You need to be able to have this notion of a centralized database for certain applications inside the enterprise and certain ideologies inside the enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, but other businesses, small and medium business, will want to quickly advance to the public chain. And so by building the protocol, and Ali can give us a little bit more detail on that, building this protocol allows us to participate also in the decentralized. We believe both are relevant. Both will be just as they are today inside a, let's call it a quote, firewall. 
-hmm. and then in the future out in the public. So that's the, the architecture that we see and that's what we're building. Towards. Got it. Okay. Now what's interesting also, Ali, you guys have been doing the tech for some time. You're doing it in such a way where you're really focused on making sure the quality is there, having spoken to you before. Now, hybridization seems to be essentially what Bob's saying in that you're respecting both sides of this coin, literally, with no pun intended. Now, how are we going to do this? What's the technological score? What's the value add for One Ledger in terms of setting you apart technologically to be able to achieve this fundamental hybridization so that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater? So, I mean, from, from that perspective, is a lot of it's going to be reliant on our, our ability to integrate from through an SDK, right? Um, the SDK allows us to do a live pass between the firewall and into, um, into our blockchain ecosystem. Um, aside from that, we have connectors that we're building for um, specifically for um, for databases that we can connect to with our uh, with our uh, enterprise SDK. So it's going to be centralized around that SDK. Right. And when you say databases, can we just clarify as well? Are you talking about blockchains in that sense too? Being no, no. So centralized databases. So like imagine that you have CRM systems and you have uh, you have uh, payment management systems and things like that, or you need to access data from from mm -hmm. the from um, uh, from the client side. So specifically from a customer. Right. Um, we would have connectors into those databases to make sure that we can actually bring information that we need. Right. Okay. Now let's bring that to the blockchain domain for a second. Let's talk about SDKs with regard to how you're going to connect with other blockchains or your power, because essentially you are a, a generic agnostic system. So how does it work there in that respect? So that's not going through the SDK. So the SDK will be just into our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, on the other side of our, uh, our blockchain, we're actually building an adapter where we're calling it, Currently, it's called a chain driver engine. Um, and what that allows you to do, it allows you to easily create drivers for multiple blockchains um, and act as literally a gateway between um, several different blockchains. So once you connect into one ledger, uh, we can route the messaging to either, uh, sorry, to any one of the blockchains that I actually have integrations with. Right. Okay. Now, can we recap those as well? What are those blockchains that you're currently integrated with and why? Yeah. So as we talked about, you know, making sure that we have um, um, a scalable and like and a facilitating a, a proper um, facilitating quality as we're building our um, our uh, our blockchain. We've actually currently only looked at Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, we've done that from the point of our MVP. We haven't iterated on that currently um, as we started building the chain driver. So once the chain driver is in place, our chain driver engine is in place, then we're going to start iterating on the different drivers. So as it stands right now with our test net, um, you can only connect uh, to Ethereum and Bitcoin if you're hosting a node. Now, we, don't, we want to move away from that concept completely. We want right. to move, move to a concept where you can directly connect it into, from our test net, Kronos, into any one of the test nets uh, for Ethereum and for, for Bitcoin. So um, that's our next step in our, in our evolution. And to do that, we're actually building the chain driver. So then once we move into mainnet, it makes it even more easier, easier to connect into the mainnets of Ethereum and, and, and Bitcoin. Right. And what I like um, about you guys as well is that you've mentioned very clearly that you're at the, that test net phase now. You're moving towards the mainnet. Now, you're not rushing. So, Bob, how does it feel to be taking the time carefully to make sure that you can develop, iterate, as Ali's saying, and really get ready for the kind of necessitates of this uh, future of, of enterprise? I'll be honest with you, Brad. <clears throat> Going slow is the most frustrating thing in the world. <laughs> Especially in blockchain uh, with how fast it moves. Well, um, I say that, but I say that with purpose. Mm -hmm. um, it's frustra frustrating, yes, because we know that what is expected in the world of technology is move fast. We are, in fact, moving fast in the math, in the algorithms, in the science, but translating that now into the, the uh, may I say it like this, lines of code, functionality, and in, in terms of business value, takes a little more time. Mm -hmm. um, we've beefed up in the last three months our team substantially, um, most recently with some very, very deep-ended development for protocol and architecture as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we're taking our time. 
Um, I remember, uh, and this is going back a little bit, but June last year, I remember speaking with David Cha, our CEO, and saying, hey, are we moving fast enough? Right. So, so we're intently concerned about that, but you know, we're not going to be sucked into the deliver fast and fail. Mm. What we want to do is we want to deliver to the vision where you know, we have the grace of, of runway to be able to do this. Um, we have, in some ways, the grace of a bit of a bull market, uh, sorry, a bit of a bear market right. to be able to, to be patient and be able to put our heads down and deliver the technology. Our focus right now is deliver the technology. Without it, you know, what are we doing? Right. Got it, so, Bob. Now, what you're saying there as well, sure, and I appreciate that, mate. And what you said in there is that you have the runway. So I, I'm hearing that you cashed out, you have an, uh, enough money to, keep, to, to stay the bear. So how's the financial position right now? Are you comfortable with where you're at? Yeah. So, um, you know, I've worked with a number of early stage companies who at this stage in their life, almost two years in, uh, are starting to worry about uh, their burn rates and starting to worry about where, where is their next funding come, uh, coming from. David did a really good job in the beginning. Uh, David actually and Edward to uh, go to the marketplace and, you know, uh, timing happened to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and they were smart enough to take enough out to fund the vision. I'll be honest, you know, like every company in this marketplace, uh, we certainly have a certain hedge in the marketplace. It's in oh. as good quality as uh, you can, but that's for obvious business reasons. We're heavily invested in our, our own tokens and have been, you know, aggressively buying them back and that sort of thing to, to support the marketplace because we mm -hmm. believe in it. And we believe in the token economy, so we're participating. Right. Um, but yeah, we've got the runway, we've got the patients, uh, we're adding to the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Which, why people want to make yeah. sure that you have that capacity because obviously you want to make sure that this team can, is, has the ability financially to keep going until mm -hmm. that point in which mainnet happens and actualization of business happens. Yeah, we, uh, I'll just be open and candid with you. Well, we have well over two years, well over two years to go. Lots, lots of runway ahead of us. Right. And, and, and you'll see good things from one ledger by the end of 2019. So looking forward to finding more fun. about that. I'm really looking forward to seeing this unfold. Now, Ali, I want to talk to you about the imperatives of having that base blockchain structure, because there are other companies out there with like nature who don't have that. They tend to be just solely that product base. So I want to talk to you about that when we establish one ledger itself. Um, clarifying, are you underpinned by your own blockchain or are you, once again, like some of the others, and just have that BAS model or the SaaS model? So the underpinning architecture is Tendermint for consensus. Um, building our own consensus algorithm would have obviously taken a lot, lot longer. But from a transaction management perspective and the protocol that sits on top of uh, Tendermint, we've built it ourselves. So I've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of implementations where people are looking at like Ethermint or, you know, taking Ethereum and using it as, as the underlying blockchain or forking it and so on. Uh, we're not doing that. Um, we're, very, we're very explicit about using Tendermint because it's consensus, but building the protocol engine itself and, or overlying protocol layer, uh, we're writing that ourselves and we've done it. So um, as part of Testnet, we have transaction management available, um, the ability to set up your own account on the node. Um, we also brought it uh, one ledger VM, which allows you to port over JavaScript smart contracts. Okay. Um, so we've not gone with Solidity, we've gone with JavaScript uh, because we, we're trying to um, we're trying to appeal to the larger JavaScript community. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I mean, and, and all of that's functional right now. We're, we are doing a lot of testing because we are in testnet. So there will be uh, rounds of load testing that we'll be doing. There'll be rounds of uh, testing um, more um, robust logic when it comes to uh, JavaScript smart contracts. Um, mm -hmm. And we're going through those processes right now. Got it. Now that's exciting to hear because essentially you're opening up to a, great, a much greater pool of developers who can then go and engage and work with one ledger. How's that going so far with the feedback from these developers as they, you know, obviously you're allowing the, the team in-house uh, to explore and, and play with the, the script. Is it, is it something that they appreciate, that they enjoy and they find easy? So for sure. I mean, like going, going into Solidity, it might be a little bit different from, um, 
uh, from JavaScript, but the, like, having JavaScript as the base language makes it a lot easier for these developers to kind of um, adapt to our blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, also there's a benefit there where Solidity, you're gonna, you have to embed a lot of your libraries into the, the smart contracts that you're deploying with the way we've structured and architected things. Uh, the JavaScript libraries are actually just hosted by the validators, which means you're not getting these bulky smart contracts anymore. Uh, what you're getting is just the logic you're writing and you have the ability to import your smart contract into your, uh, or just write an import statement for, for JavaScript um, so that you can reference the libraries, but you're not actually uh, deploying these 10 meg files anymore. Um, it's a simple logic that you're writing. Right. Now, with regard to the whole purpose of this, let's bring it back to enterprise. It's always an important conversation to see if there is a market fit and if there's a market need. So where's the evidence, guys? I might start with you, Bob. Talk us through, you're, in the, you've got, you're both based in the US, is that right? Uh, no, we're both based in Canada. Okay, yeah. Canada, my apologies. Right. I yeah. should never yeah. say that to a Canadian. Now, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, so you're based in essentially this developing region, which is you know, relevant in the context of what you're trying to do uh, with enterprise. Not easy to appease the, the powers that be with regard to compliance and regulation you're really trying to bring that forward in a progressive way, but how do you um, showcase and illustrate to enterprises that one ledger has the ability to change the game financially so that they can have cost savings, efficiency, productivity as key outcomes? Man, I wish we could do all that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the plan, that's the plan, right? Listen, the idea in the enterprise, of course, is <laughs> A lot has to happen in the enterprise, okay? okay. So for one ledger to be, um, to gain traction in the enterprise, it needs two sides of the story. There needs to be a use case contemplated in the enterprise. And there needs to be a need to do an interaction with another party, be it a database, be it a business transaction, be it a network, be it a blockchain network, you name it. There is that need. Um, but those two have to be in place in order for there to actually be the need for the one ledger and the facilitating ability of one ledger. Mm -hmm. So we have to go to the enterprise in partnership with others. So others who are today uh, working on use cases in, in our focus area currently is supply chain. So working on use cases in supply chain. And, you know, if you look at where the, the large enterprises today is, they're in the experimental stage and research. And so we are aiming to go in with partners to provide that one ledger infrastructure mm -hmm. in order for the enterprise to do research and development on blockchain technologies. Okay. That's, that's the current pathway in. The, the long pathway, two to three years from now, when there's more use case um, and more infrastructure and robust interest inside the uh, infra inside the enterprise, we'll be able to go directly into the enterprise and make a direct offering to them of one ledger technologies, services, and support. Right. Um, so uh, as I said, uh, where we're at with that, we are validating the needs around generally blockchain and we get, you know, it's time, it's cost. It's, there, there's a huge contraction in business cycles that you can offer in supply chain. You can offer, you know, identity and you can offer assurance from source to end many, many ah. applications. Um, be candid. We contemplated building a specific use case. Um, that's too much of a bet. Mm -hmm. So the smart thing for us is to uh, work with partners to enter today and then find a pathway to go direct once the infrastructure is more robust. Right. Okay. Well, let's talk about that, Bob, because clearly you're still working towards the main that you're working towards the proof, that proof of adoption that we must see for all blockchains in terms of that enterprise frame. But right now, let's talk about constructing the potential for partnerships. You know, who are you engaging with? Who are you talking to? If it starts in Canada, let's go there. Because clearly education is one of the key challenges right now for these enterprises, especially in a traditional frame, to even understand what blockchain can do to reconceptualize their and, and, and invigorate their own business model. Mm -hmm. So Ali, I'm gonna throw a little bit of that to you about the current partner partnership program and maybe you could uh, answer the question around who's it in the game. Um, and then I'll come back and, and give you another perspective. That'd be great. So there's various like partnerships with regards to blockchain companies that we're working with. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we're looking at things like Tumble Chain, P Chain. Um, there's a company that we work explicitly with here in Toronto. That's BlockX, uh, BlockX Labs. Um, we're looking at. Um, uh, I, I don't want to mention partnerships that I have. We haven't actually. I appreciate that. No problem at all. So I, I, I'm trying to veer around the ones that we haven't spoken about. Um, sure. But there's several ones in the blockchain industry itself that we're partnered with up to about 25 uh, different partnerships. And what we're trying to do there is is on three different fronts, right? We want to be able to support our infrastructure for one, right? So uh, being able to um, host our, our, our nodes, uh, keeping them up as validated nodes, uh, that's one of the things that, that, that we're, we're partnering on. Another thing we're partnering on is obviously our marketing, right? So if there's inter- interoperability use cases uh, with some of these partners, then uh, we're definitely exposing those if there is uh, making one ledger your under, underlying blockchain, um, that's another uh, another partnership opportunity, right? Um, where a lot of these uh, a lot of these um, blockchain companies, they may or may not have uh, the proper infrastructure underlying uh, their blockchain, or they're using, like I said, Ethereum or Ethermint. Um, we can replace that underlying architecture with one ledger um, right. and enable them for interoperability. And you make a good point also with regard to marketing, because if those, for those who aren't sure, one ledger is about being that hub, a bespoke model in which people can, or in enterprises and CEOs for that matter, can go to as a, a means in transferring their current data into a, a more hybridized model for yep. their own needs. Now, right. Bob, in that respect, talk us through the next, next aspect of this question with regard to enterprise uh, building partnerships, the things that you know. Yeah, so let, let me give you sort of a front end and a back end of that. For the front end, we're working with several local uh, universities and colleges to create uh, blockchain ambassadors and to create an interest in one ledger early in the education cycle. Um, and so that's proving to us to, uh, to bear fruit early in, uh, in interest and have come out to our development meetups. Okay. We'll continue, continue to do that sort of thing to create, a, I will call it a front end uh, interest in the technology and the brand one ledger. Uh, on the back end, a very significant partnership. I could, uh, not yet fully inked, okay. but we're, we're, we're talking to the folks at a, uh, a place called Mars. M-A-R-S. Right. Um, in, in Toronto, um, which arguably is a hotbed of uh, blockchain technology and capability, we have a massive population here of, cap- of expertise and, and uh, capability and interest, investment, and actual companies doing work in blockchain. It's a, it's so a bit like Silicon Valley for the U.S. as far as I've heard. Yeah, and it's a little bit like Boston, too, if, okay. if you think about it. Right, a concentration with uh, with really good universities, mm-hmm. some of the top universities here. So terrific math people, um, lots of buzz, and I'll tell you, a lot of funding from some big companies to uh, to get this technology going. Like we're right. interested, and we want to have we want to have a blockchain expertise in Toronto. So we got a hub to work with, which is fantastic. Okay, now it clearly, Mars, the, just, clearly just, the, the academics bring it back bring it back oh. to Mars. So the hub. Mars is one of those players in the hub. And so what we're, we're working to go with them is to be part of their infrastructure offering through the hub. Okay, and so for us, for us, that would be excellent partnership. So Mars is a big deal because as you mentioned, it's basically the bringing Harvard, Stanford and Berkeley all together in one, you know, in that sense for, and my apologies, I just know those US uh, yeah. pro- prominent universities. But I want to talk more in the government sector as well, because one thing's for sure, Canada is leading the way, arguably, with interactions with government support. Now, where's the stance there? Are you also engaged in any way to try and educate them about the imperatives of having this hope, this hub model? <laughs> I guess you know the answer to that one. Right, uh, okay. Listen, I saw Ali move back and forth there thinking how we yeah, could yeah, yeah, no, 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 I'll answer it though. I will okay. answer it. Right. Listen, I, I personally have about 20 years working with governments, federal and provincial and municipal across Canada. Uh, love them dearly. Um, what uh, the consumption of resources to work in, uh, in a uh, public environment like that is just beyond our, our capacity to serve today to be perfectly candid. Mm-hmm. We track them. Uh, we want to see uh, where we can play in use case, but to be candid with you, it's just a little bit out of our marketing reach at this stage. Right. Okay. So clearly you plan to become more integrated, more 
uh, involved in that domain as you, so let's go back again once to the roadmap right now. So Ali, right now, talk us through the technological position because obviously everything needs to be ready for mainnet. So where are we at with regard to the tech? What are the core features that you're building right now? So like I mentioned earlier, like the, one, of the, one of the core features is that chain driver. And so the chain driver engine puts us into Q2 or end of Q2 for delivery. Um, what that sh at that point in time, what we want to be able to do is support five blockchains. So in addition to Ethereum and, and, and uh, BTC, we mm -hmm. would support three others. Um, and so that's where we really want to be. And that's our position that we want to take. Um, and then we can officially say that, you know, we're solving interoperability. Right now, the way we're solving it is, um, is very much an MVP version. Um, that being said, the other, the other focus is the JavaScript smart contracts, building a more robust set of libraries so that developers can move forward. Um, right. We focused, obviously, we, we released that beta for the, one, for the One Explorer, which allows you to see Explorer, like uh, content on the Explorer. Um, we have a, a command line client that allows you to create transactions on the, on the network. Once we get those three pieces kind of aligned, what we want to really do is then focus on uh, auxiliary applications like a wallet. Um, so we've done some of the elementary, build, like elementary research on the wallet. We've started building out some microservices. Um, but we're really trying to now double back and focus on the protocol and make sure that that's um, essentially uh, ready to be launched. And so the, the focus right now is protocol, protocol, protocol. It's testing the protocol, making sure it's robust enough, making sure that we can um, facilitate, you know, 100 different nodes across the world um, and that they're all communicating seamlessly. Um, when you bring up a new node, you have the ability to catch up at a reasonable amount of time with the number of blocks. So those are really the focuses um, okay. currently going into Q2. Right. Now, what about customization as well? That's going to be really important for not only your permission components, but the, the connection with enterprise so that they can uh, essentially articulate what they want to do, how they want to construct their own, uh, arguably, their node so that they can privatize, they can have uh, private data, but they can also actualize all the benefits of the public system mm -hmm. that you've built. From that, from that perspective, our testnet's already capable to support a private network. We're not necessarily focused on um, trying to be able to facilitate that at this point in time. I think between the private network and the public network, I think anybody in blockchain that has any credibility to tell you the public network is more, um, it's more feature rich and it's way more difficult to facilitate, especially the fact that um, a lot of the configuration components for the public network have to be dynamic. They cannot be manually uh, set up. Whereas on the private side, everything can be manually set up. You know the number of nodes that you're launching. You know the configuration set. So um, a lot of those components can be easily set up from a private perspective. So we're not as worried uh, when it comes to setting up a new customer. Um, we have that capability today. Um, we're more concerned about the public network and how that's going to be facilitated. Mm. Um, because it's really, that's really the complexity. Right. Now let's talk about security because you've said it exactly the way it is. In a private network, security is not such an issue, but it certainly is as you bridge this into the real, the real world and open up the public you know, discussion for blockchain. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to ensure that you address those, those three features of that so-called trilemma so that you can ensure that it has strong security and it also has the scalability to match? So, I mean, we, we were approaching like uh, companies, uh, sorry, um, uh, developers that are, are approaching us with regards to security vulnerabilities. We employ them and, uh, and help them actually um, hack our network essentially, right? So that's really the way we're going about doing this. Yeah. Um, once we become more situated and are moving towards mainnet, we will be, we will be approaching companies that are f focusing on security as, as um, um, as a, like as a service for the, for us, um, and being able to do penetration tests into our network. So that's that's kind of the approach we're taking. Um, for the time being, yes, you know, security is a concern. Um, we have uh, our DevOps in place to be able to um, protect against DDoS and 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 you know, man in the middle attacks, things like that. Um, but I don't think that um, we're in a place right now where. Um, we're as vulnerable as some of the other. Uh, okay. So you're hitting the nail on the head with security through the testing and much like you'd pay someone to go and test the vaults of banks. That's cool to know. But what about the scalability feature with regard to TPS capabilities? Because we hear these ridiculous buzzwords. You clearly both aren't coming across like that. 
but are you meeting the needs of your testing uh, for the requisites of or being an interoperable uh, blockchain hub so that you can properly scale? Yeah, and then that's going to come in from a function from the from the sidechain functionality. I mean, it's going to increase throughput substantially. Um, and the, um, as far as transactions per second are concerned, I mean, um, we're with um, we're kind of currently using BFC, right? So our fin we have instant finality when it comes to um, the transactions. Um, so we're not as concerned about um, uh, the transactions being committed to the network and things like that because um, the blocks are being generated immediately. So it's not it's not as much of a concern. But for as far as throughput's concerned, um, we are going towards a side chain function where you will have the capability of um, pinning um, nodes to our side chains, mm -hmm. and that will increase throughput. That's interesting because often when the finality um, tax is taken and, and you focus there, it does compromise in some respects that ability to really showcase your throughput, to really showcase the increase in nodes and parallel scale. So, mm -hmm. you know, once again, how do you work on that, that balance between having strong finality but also having the ability to increase your nodes as it's required um, as you build out? You saying increase the number of nodes that are in the network, or right. increase the number of side chains? So, I, like I like I said, so the 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 the, cap the capability to expand the number of nodes. I mean, that's just that's just creating elasticity on the network, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have the capability of doing that today. We we we're, we're our, our nodes are Dockerized, they're easily to implement, easily spin up new nodes. It's not that's not that's not that's not a lot a lot of complexity there. But being able to throw. Um, uh, being able to throw uh, the, the transactions into a sidechain, I think that's a little bit more complex. And being able to facilitate a Bitcoin and Ethereum transaction on a specific, tra specific um, sidechain, that's where the complexity is. And that's what we're looking at doing um, in the second half of the year. Right. Now, uh, I was alluding also to you know, narratives much like sharding in the sense that how do you also ensure that you don't put a lot of computational pressure on the whole ecosystem itself and you can concentrate mm -hmm. to key areas like the clustering we've seen again in that sharding approach. So how are you going to do that so that you once again can scale successfully, but you don't have to do it to the entire ecosystem all at once? So again, I, a lot of that architectural com complexity, we're, we're, we're positioned for it in Q in the second half of the, uh, of the year. So we're working towards what those architectural decisions are going to be okay. right now. It includes includes things like how we're going to do our stake, how we're going to do our governance. Um, some of those questions we're still answering currently in this quarter, so we can start working on it in Q4. And sorry, right. Q3. Ali, it's really impressive how you really genuinely are taking your time. When we do, when I speak to so many different, um, you know, CTOs, for example, often so much is rushed, so much is done so quickly because of the requisites of the, the space. Now, now, Bob, obviously you'd be proud of be making sure that your team are taking the time to get all of these technological uh, ticks right. And, and, but with regard to that, um, let's talk a little bit more about the team itself. Um, how big is the technological team? You know, and what, what, what's their key roles in, the, in this space with regard to specifics in, in the technological frame? Um. Help me if I'm not answering your question properly, Ali. No. Um, but you know, the core dev team consists of uh, architecture and dev manager, mm -hmm. architect. Mm -hmm. um, roughly five protocol engineers mm -hmm. um, and a couple of full stack people um, and DevOps. So, right. so it's roughly quite about, strong. You've really focused roughly on about ten people. Roughly about 10 people, okay? Okay, so is that the majority of your team, Bob? Yeah, it sure is. Uh, when we add Ali, we have a, a director of product, we have community management, which is a, a not an insignificant size of team. There's four people, five people worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we also have someone who manages the whole investment community and the whole market making and all that. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, myself and David, so we're about 18 people today. Mm -hmm. uh, we see adding maybe two or three more in dev uh, to support the push to mainnet. Uh, we're hiring them right now as we speak. Um, that's been an interesting process. We can touch on if you want sometime. Um, uh, <laughs> but so that'll push the dev team to roughly 12, 13 people. Okay. That's so what, so that's Alex, we need to commit. 
Right. So, Ali, obviously you're part of the leadership of the tech side. How do you feel uh, all the different aspects of tech are being addressed in this team? Is it adequate? Um, and, and is there strong evidence that you're really moving forward to suit the needs of what, you, what the whole team are trying to strive for for Mainnet? I think, I mean, for sure. Like, we, we definitely are taking our time to get things done, but at the same time, we are striding forward. Um, we have the capability, like I said, to launch our testnet in December. We've you know, gone ahead and, and pushed out our, our beta for our One Explorer. Um, so, so the deadlines that we've, we've, uh, we've set out for ourselves, we are meeting them. Um, that being said, as far as the more complex components are concerned, uh, which is the second half of this year, I would say, um, we're staffed pretty well to kind of tackle those. Um, if you asked me this question back in October when I joined, I'd probably give you a different answer. <laughs> right. Okay. We, 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 we basically bulked up on the dev side, um, adding an architect, adding DevOps. We added um, another stellar Golang developer. Um, our, our protocol is based on in Golang. Um, and so, so, you know, from as far as our expertise on, de on um, decentralized systems is concerned, it's actually growing. Got it. Okay, now let's talk about times uh, with regard to the future. So, so if we take, uh, move away from technology for one second and think more in the speculative frame, there are a lot of people who want to know what the plan is forward with regard to uh, actualizing your business or you, essentially your protocols so that people can then go and interact in the ecosystem of let's dare I say speculative investment, you know, how, when's all this going to happen so people can start to engage with one ledger from a tokens perspective so they can um, see this evolve in the real world. Are you asking us to predict when the um, bear market will end and things will turn around? <laughs> or are you asking us to predict what are the events that will lead to mass blockchain adoption. Bring it, bring it all on, because I'd love to know what the plan is for one ledger in terms of, you know, what the people can expect. Yeah, I said, I think I said earlier that a lot has to happen for the enterprise to go. A lot less has to happen for what I'll call a medium-sized business and and agile business to work. Um, so my bet is, uh, 2020 is a good year to see some adoption, to mm -hmm. see some interest and some see, see some benefits in what I'll call isolated industries or isolated uh, applications, be it supply chain, which many are targeting. Um, but, it, but you know, you brought up government. We are going to see government in healthcare. We're going to see government use it in anti-fraud uh, and, and uh, you know, identity management. So we're gonna see some pockets of things happen in 2020. Right. Those are the bright spots, okay? Got it. Mass adoption, uh, you know, two years away from that, to be honest with you. And so the question for one ledger is, what's your staying power for the next three years? Hmm. Right? It really is. Now We are, and I'll answer that, we are focused. The next 12 months, you should hear nothing about one ledger but tech, tech, tech. And I really mean that. Yes, we're starting to move in the marketplace and Ali's genning for the second half to put some branding and put some awareness in the marketplace and expand maybe through the, through the uh, eyes and ears of the development community first. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we've got a little time with mainnet and we see some bubbling in the marketplace, then we can, can actually exert a little bit more power there. Mm -hmm. And to be candid with you, we can shift in our resources. We're very dev, uh, dev heavy at this stage. And then we can shift into customer support, product support, and move that way. And so that's what you'll see over time is a little shift in the resources. The, the development community will, will shift to product support, new feature, having done the big job. Got and it. we have, candidly, we have some very fine people in that group who would be hugely valuable to the enterprise, uh, you know, intellectualizing of the problem, solving the problem. And so we see moving a few of the scientists into that part of the marketplace as we right. complete hard work. So clearly as well, Bob, the main net's gonna be a really big event for you to really showcase what you can do. Now, Ali, can I just talk candidly also about the status of the, the outfit itself, of this um, pro project with regard mm -hmm. to the token? So let's move to the tokenomic model. This is something that is never really that clear for many projects, but have you clearly thought this out so that the token itself can function 
um, as a true utility, can also have proper velocity, which is an imperative, and, and also showcase a correlation between the economy itself and the, the ecosystem as it grows. So that it has that paradox, that imperative of growth of value as a utility. There's no other way to explain it because it is a new model. Mm -hmm. So, so what's the exact question? So the question <laughs> is all about the tokenomics in the yeah. sense that has this been thought through very clearly so that there is evidence that it can be a viable utility, a provable utility, and one that has merits when it comes to potentials for increasing value. I mean, it's really difficult for you to comment on this because it's not a security, but yeah. it has a unique design. So, so, so it's, been, it's been well thought through when, uh, at the time of our, our white paper. Now, uh, that being said, um, we are reevaluating some components of it, specifically about um, how the staking mechanism is gonna work when it's, when it's regarded to sidechains. Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at sidechains, are you staking, um, um, if you're a Bitcoin sidechain or if you're an Ethereum sidechain, um, are you staking Ethereum? Are you staking Bitcoin? How, like, how does that all, all how does the complexity work? We are in a process of reevaluating that specifically, because as we're coming up on our, on our um, ability to do staking and governance, um, we want to make sure that the mechanics are in place correctly um, and that, uh, you know, uh, the token economics is correct um, for our entire model. So we're working with our, our mathematicians on our end. Um, we have, you know, great advisors on that front. Um, as well as um, other um, other third party companies that have approached us, um, we're working with them specifically on the on the token economic model. Okay. Now, in terms of access, uh, I want to clarify that with you, Bob, as well. Now, listing wise, exchanges, talk us through what you can. <laughs> what, is well, it nothing? <laughs> 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 what can you can tell? Uh, with regard to the plan, obviously you both have one. That reaction tells me everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's not a lot I'm I'm going to talk about. Okay. Currently, currently listed as listed, uh, but I do want to come back to this question about token economics. Okay. okay? And, and the economy, um, and make a perhaps a bold statement that the number one priority is to create a value prop which creates utility and use around the token. That will drive, at least in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. that will start to drive the value in the, let me call it the investment value of holding an asset like a one ledger token. Right. Okay. So our focus is on the former versus the latter at this stage. Mm. We do have Edwin Zhang, who I would think would be a fascinating uh, follow-up uh, yeah, I'd love to, actually. Because Edwin is our token economy guy. Okay. Both Ali and I are dodging the question because... <laughs> it's a tough we're one. one. One, we're sworn to secrecy. And two, uh, Edwin, is, Edwin Zhang is our spokesperson for that. Mm -hmm. uh, he owns it. He controls it. He's deeply involved. And, and I would offer to you that he's, to. he's one of the experts in the world on this. Okay. Um, and so it would be a very, very uh, interesting conversation. And he can disclose a heck of a lot more. Than yes, that. and it would be uh, arguably imperative because I would, I would suggest that I that's agree. one of the most important parts to really prove because people are placing their trust in this new model of utility when in many cases in other projects, it's just bullshit. There isn't yeah. proof in that. There isn't, we don't have the experts that you're alluding to here with your own team and they haven't thought it through. So they end up with, essentially a fundraising token. They end up with a settlement token, but they don't end up with a utility token in, in all cases. So it really is important that people can know exactly how you can build out and trust that, these, that the speculator can play around with a utility token and still know that it is utility and not a security. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the fact that we are in such a depressed market right now creates uh, different uh, stressors on that very question. Mm -hmm. uh, trust, um, you know, belief, those are all being threatened right now. And, and you asked me earlier, when, when, will I see, when will I have that kind of optimism? I say 2020, I'm, I'm being hopeful mm. that all the fighting wow. get done this year and whatever that looks like, and then we'll be able to emerge 
with, uh, with more optimism and just a whole lot more activity and a sense of momentum, which will dig us out of this, you know, this, the terrible economics around tokens or, or sure. you know, the whole, the whole and, coin world. And do you feel that the, the international sort of, uh, uh, do you feel that the international sector with regard to compliance and regulations all very much pro utility? Because there's an argument right now that the STO is going to, you know, become a narrative of relevance. Mm. But many regions in the world are also taking utility tokens all the way to legislation. So are you confident that it's going to be a real thing? I think the beauty of uh, utility tokens for governments is they're taxable. Right. <laughs> right? right. They're assets. Yeah. Um, and, and so they can see them as, uh, as an income and, and tax source. Uh, much more than you can a pure uh, security. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me to make sense to to sort of promote that and, and be friendly toward that idea. Sure. Um, it creates different problems for the holders of, of those assets, right? But, uh, but I think that's probably the direction we're going to see, and that's why there's some interest in going that way. Right. I, I just can't. I don't know enough about the blockers for uh, regulatory blockers. Edwin knows quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about the, the regulatory blockers to be able to say how big a job of this or what's the timeline before mm -hmm. we, we, get, uh, we get unstuck. Clearly, you've seen even in the last three months, some moves. You've mm -hmm. seen SEC moves, you've, been, you've seen EU moves. We've seen moves in uh, the, let, let's call them the offshore friendly uh, markets in the Carib Caribbean have been making moves that are friendlier toward blockchain. So I think, I think people want to see success. What they don't want is right. they don't want, they don't want shysters in the marketplace. And Absolutely. They don't want people who are stealing and you know when you when you lose 180 million bucks in in coin and and you know people have lost their savings that mm. gets the news. And so we have to shake some of that. Yes, and that's what we're obviously trying to do with really bringing the enterprise and institutional sector in because once that yeah. voice is heard and they can see efficiency, productivity, and most importantly, cost savings utilizing blockchain, everything arguably could change. Now, let's talk about that for a moment, Ali. There's competitors out there or there's other current designs where they do a BAS model, a SaaS model, some have blockchain-based tech underneath them, but they are already showing that they can integrate with major players. And they're certainly already operational. Some of them are even on exchanges right now. So, what are you are you concerned about that? Because clearly, Bob's got that relaxed tone. You know, you've got that chill factor. But the reality is, there's a well, a whip that's being cracked right now on this this whole issue of trying to get that first market move. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like I mean, there's definitely more enough market share for everybody to go around. People are people are in the market doing POC, not in the market doing production activity. Mm -hmm. um, one of the statistics I saw recently was like one percent of the POCs that have actually uh, have actually made it to production. Um, so I think that yes, you're right. There there is a lot of market activity going on. Um, but I don't necessarily think that, you know, people have moved forward with them. And so where you see failures of Hyperledger and things like that, that's where we'll capitalize on um, as one ledger, um, not only being um, the blockchain for enterprise, but simultaneously being able to take them into the inter interoperability use cases. Okay. Now, what about revenue? Now, I'm going to mention two and throw it out there that I'm familiar with three, actually. So Unibright, Morpheus Labs, Quant Network, all of them doing something in relation to interoperability or doing them something in terms of education, having a, a, a bedrock uh, software system. All of these interfaces are built. So in their different regions in the world right now, they are literally engaging with business. I know for a fact, and they're doing that with the government support in some instances, actually all of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're in Toronto, you've also got an interface, you've got this ability to really showcase what you can do for enterprise. But do you feel like you're doing enough in the re with respect to you know, working towards generating revenue quickly? Because these guys are seeming to do that. Um, for sure. I mean, like, uh, you know, um, Bob brought up Mars, right? And Mars, when we were talking about with an ecosystem from, um, um, from uh, the university perspective, but say simultaneously, they're also an ecosystem for enterprise business and government. Okay. Um, and giving us leeway into that. So there's a lot of those type of associations that we're actually kind of um, trying to partner with. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're definitely moving uh, within 2019 
towards um, attracting as many enterprises as we can. Um, that being said, are we concerned with revenue at this point in time? No, we're not. We have runway, right? We have runway for another, easily another two years. So yes, you know, we are going after enterprise, but at the same time, uh, we're not struggling with financial issues that we need to actually have um, revenue coming in. Right. Currently. Got it. Now to wrap up, Bob, I want to ask you, how would you summarize one ledger? you using the slogans that are on the website, using all of the, the white paper. How would you articulate what really the mission, the vision and the ethos is of one ledger? Um, you know, I, I think I want to keep it really, really simple. Our mantra is blockchain for business mm -hmm. um, and, and in a neutral zone. And I mean that, in, in a real sense. So am I worried about competitors? No, I would like to be, reach out to everybody who wants to touch uh, my one ledger system and could we reach out and interact with their network as well. Um, what I see is a one ledger being pivotal in helping bridge this sort of public private, uh, bridge the enterprise uh, with, with external and uh, internal you know, sort of networks and databases. Uh, I see us as a, you know, a friendly player. So, and, I, and I'm not looking for one ledger to be a unicorn. What I'm looking for one ledger to be is a utility and be useful to people and help them realize the benefits of a blockchain. So that's pretty, you know, that's fluff, right? Mm. In some ways. Mm. But, but what I'm trying to say is that's where our focus is at this stage. Right. And, uh, and, and so we're not, we're not trying to, you know, sort of push anybody away. We welcome everybody who makes a move and would like to be part of that as well. And appreciate your frankness there. Now, Ali, obviously on top of the open protocol that Bob's talking about, there is the services, the products that you plan to build in the future. That's where you do create revenue. Are you also very much involved in the developing those, those first products that allow for one ledger to be sustainable, to have that model beyond the open protocol? Yeah, totally. Um, there's definitely pro like uh, there's definitely projects in the works um, with regards to how we're going to be generating revenue. Um, they're going to be part of our second half of this, this second half of this year's initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to like what the applications are exactly, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into detail with those. But uh, I mean, like the public applications, you know what they are, right? They're they're right. gonna be more extensive work on the on the one explorer. It's gonna be more extensive work. Uh, on developing a wallet and making sure that that you know transactions are enabled, um, you can probably presume that our wallet's not going to be like any other wallet. We're going to leverage that atomic swap a lot, and we're going to definitely be able to put that um, into an uh, into an environment where people can do peer to peer uh, transactions. So I mean, you can kind of based on the way we're set up, you can kind of. Um, uh, assume that we're going in that direction, um, especially on the public side. As far as the private sector is concerned, um, um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go no, into detail. No, I do, I do appreciate also that. But I, I, I just would like to pile on just a little bit for you on that, Brad. Mm -hmm. Strategy. Right? right now, it's build, build, build yeah. to main that. Mm -hmm. We're we're spending uh, a small amount of time to be candid with you about the question that you just asked. Sure. When I say a small amount of time, over the course of the year, it's probably three months worth of five people's time into that question. Mm -hmm. We recognize it and we have it on the timeline for when we have to turn our attention to it. But I, I just want to remind everybody who's listening, that's not our focus today. Mm -hmm. Our focus today is be in a position to deliver what we said we we're going to deliver in the timelines mm -hmm. with a robust community that supports that. Right. Okay. That right. value, that, that value prop to take to any business is, you know, irrefutable because you, it. it's just us. It's us in the community going together. And that's okay. what we're focused on. So, you know, and we, we do know that we can build that other, we can build that other pipeline and we can, we can build to the revenue stream once we've got what I just described. Got it. Now, Bob, clearly you're not about bullshit. You know, very, you're very transparent about that. You're all about the infrastructure right now and that's it. You know, you're about building this tech, building this tech and building this tech. Once that's all complete, 
then you're going to move into the next step and that's really build this out really scale and really take this to the you know the adoption that it can have in the enterprise frame so i really appreciate just how serious you've been about that i think we've got it crystal clear now what about the social media strategies ali what is being done because when you're a tech team often that can get overlooked uh, not enough information can get through are you guys doing enough to let your community your supporters your investors know that <coughs> everything's on track i certainly think so um you've you've spoken to here <laughs> on on a several different paths he's the director of um community director, and uh, he's got four of the CMs working with him worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, and they're doing a phenomenal job. I think that uh, we're releasing media, like two or three media articles a month. Um, there's uh, YouTube videos that are going out. Um, we do a lot, when, when we're attending events, there's a lot of um, exposure to the events we're attending, the events we're speaking at. Um, we just recently hosted, in, uh, a month and a half ago, we hosted a, a developer meetup um, uh, here at One Ledger. Um, so there's definitely stuff that we're doing as far as community is concerned. We're definitely doing outreach uh, both in the enterprise spectrum and in the, and the blockchain space. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a bit going on. We're also in the university. Uh, it, we're also reaching out to the universities within uh, the Southern Ontario and the Toronto region. Um, and making sure that we have a lot, like uh, we have uh, ambassadors there. So there's quite a bit of activity when it comes to the community, especially blockchain. Right now, for, for for more information, Bob, as well, how can we go and learn more about it? How can someone go and become more educated about One Ledger? Join us on Telegram for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, participate in um, in our events as we have those. Um, we um, not only do them live, but we broadcast them so you can participate, uh, you know, electronically in that. Um, feel free to reach out, you know, contact us and, uh, and be part of our own community. Um, I did want to say something, though, just uh, back to what Ali was talking about, the community. You know, you might ask yourself, well, how do you know that they're with you? Mm. Um, and quite apart from from the feedback in the, in the channel, which, you know, 23,000 or plus members is, is quite an active group. It is. Um, but we did earlier, we made an offer to the community on our lockup program. And we had, uh, I won't give you the exact number, but we had a really tremendous response. And what they said to us is, we believe in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're willing to lock up our tokens for up to two years. Wow. Wow. Um, that to me is a huge endorsement from the community. That really is, especially right now. I mean, they're literally hodling and that's a yep. rare proof because <laughs> the narrative usually right now is just a whole bunch of speculation and traders. So these yeah. guys are there for the long haul, much like yeah. you see in the traditional sense. So kudos to all of you, the community as well, because this is rare to have this kind of degree of support from the community. Yeah, we're blessed and we feel you know, we feel it gives us confidence in this notion of stay calm. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> we have to focus, you know, to push the noise away because there is lots, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that we actually can't control. We get mm -hmm. queried about it. You know, when are you going to turn around the, the uh, you know, the coin uh, disaster? If it mm. Well, that's, you know, let's, let's go there. I mean, I have to ask you this community will be screaming if I don't. You know, some would say it was a disaster, and rightly so, if you look at the charts. So let's address this right now. Are you, you know, concerned about this sentiment from that part of the community that, that have really voiced this? For sure, right? I have, I have coin that I invested mm -hmm. in the very beginning, and I'm holding. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel that pain, um, but I saw what happened, right? right. It, it was the market. And it was an enormous downdraft in the market that affected absolutely everybody. I don't think there's, there's mm -hmm. anyone who is not affected. And so we had a choice to make, mm -hmm. right? You could spend our development money to support that. You could. In the, fa in the face of a down market, the momentum in that market, the forces in that market, we couldn't spend $100 million, and $100 million wouldn't have made a difference. Right in the momentum of that marketplace. So we said, whoa, it, we have to go with the market. It'll drop, it'll hit a bottom, 
and then we have to do the hard work to build it all back. Right. Now, Bob, I'm hearing you and I respect you immensely for being so real about this because you could have thrown billions at it and it wouldn't have slowed the bear. But right now, things are a little different. We're seeing IEOs emerge. We're seeing hype come. So are you considering right now the validity or the argument possibly in-house of increasing and souping up your marketing strategies to complement all the already existent serious nature of your internal team's approach? So, because quite frankly, a lot of these other companies are doing that, whether they do it through market making, whether they do it through uh, a, a really strong PR approach, are you going to graduate towards more disclosures? Um, you know, because obviously it's a complex convolution, the crypto space, and there's lots and lots of people trying to market for pumps. Clearly that's not you, but are you going to strategize to become, you know, reinvigorate? Uh, we're not going to abandon the market. Okay, we're not going to ban the token. If you look today, we're providing a certain amount of support in the marketplace right. for one like the token. Okay, yep. so I would encourage you, and maybe this is the point to, to, uh, to remind you, Edwin Zhang, who can speak to that, would, would really give you an insight. And I think he'd be comfortable sharing your strategy. Mm -hmm. neither, neither Ali and I are actually approved. To talk well, let's about book it in. Right? Let's book it in, Bob, because I'm happy to do that with him. We'll roll the sleeves together and we'll get real about the token. I would love to. And, and you know, we can talk about token economics and, and, uh, and one ledger token and our strategy near term and long term on that. And, and Edwin, I think would be, it would be a brilliant conversation. With that would be fantastic. Well, you know, perfect segue into the closure of this interview. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Ali, thank you for providing all the tech information. I know that you guys are really busy right now and there's just no way I can really showcase everything that you are doing. Appreciate that, mate. And Bob, thank you also for providing the insights into enterprise, into the kind of all, all the work you do to lead this out so that it can become viable. Um, it's an exciting venture, what you're trying to do. There's very few that are actually successfully moving forward into attracting the real attention of real business in this enterprise sector. You guys already clearly have that attention in many different domain areas, that being the academic side, that being in the enterprise side, and more importantly, possibly right now, and that is the dev side. So you need all of those components to be successful in the future. And I do wish you all the very best. Hopefully we can catch up again towards mainnet that's, that's coming up uh, because clearly, you want to be known in the space. You want to know that everyone, that, is, that the one ledge is the real deal and that it's not simply something that's sitting in silence. Terrific. Listen, Brad, thank you so much for your time today and, uh, and we look forward to our next conversation. Likewise, thank you, Bob, and, and thanks, Ali, mate, as well. Thank you very much, Brad. Have a good one.